Um, so it says in the program that I'm going to talk about um, the use of open source around the world or participation in open source and free software around the world. So I'm actually going to give two parts to my presentation. One is starting with the economic impact of open source or Yeah, that's, that's fine. Um, so starting with the economic impact of open source or free software, or as we've been calling it in a lot of European projects, FLOS for free Libre open source software. Um, and this is based on a study that was done for the European Commission and that was published by the European Commission in, uh, in January which was uh, an official report that they published on the economic impact of open source. The study looked largely at Europe, but also at other parts of the world. And it was quite, uh, quite widely reviewed after publication because it was pretty much the first, uh, first place where you could actually see the extensive volume of different types of economic activity and economic impact that open source can have. So I'll start with that, and then I'll go on to some other data that we have and surveys that we've conducted on the participation of free software developers from different countries and different parts of the world. And we look at some of the differences that we found um, between the sort of participation that takes place in different countries. So um, I'm going to talk about, I'm probably going to skip most of the first part because many of us here probably know that and um, I want to keep in the time limit on uh, the market position of open source. Then most of what I'm going to talk about in the economic section is on value, productivity, skills and jobs. And finally on innovation, competition, R&D and growth and then I'll go on to global participation. So I'm going to skip the first few slides, but that's just an idea. And basically what, what I talk about there is how in most, most domains of software today, open source software ranks number one, number two, or number three in the market. So either you have, you might have one proprietary software solution like uh, Microsoft Office in Office applications, but the number two after that is open office. If you look at things like web servers or mail servers or many of the things that, are, that the internet is built on, their open source applications are typically the number one. Even if you look at new application areas such as application servers or uh, mobile voice over internet, a lot of the new services that are running in this area are running on open source software. Things um, like Asterisk and um, uh, other, other, other applications that use, uh, that use open source for phones and other such things. What's interesting is that even if you look outside what's normally thought of as the software sector, that's the software that you run on your desktop, in fact, open source is widely used in industry and it's used behind the scenes. So this was a survey that was done of about 500 companies in many European countries and the main focus of the survey was not the computer industry, although the computer industry is represented in the bottom two groups, computer systems and software and computer equipment. We were also looking at you know, companies such as automotives, medical instruments, telecom manufacturers, um, and other such sectors, including banking and finance. And what you find there is that these are all companies which use software not as users but as developers in a way. Software is in the products. If you look at a car, an average car sold today has lots and lots of components of software in there, driving everything from the air conditioning to the anti-lock braking system. And a lot of this software is developed within these companies or uh, integrated within these companies. And what we find here from this survey is that um, a majority of companies, even outside the computer sector, use open source software in their products. If you look at examples like, uh, uh, well, the wireless router here, just as most wireless routers, is probably running Linux and other open source software. Siemens has uh, an MRI machine um, 
to do MRI scans, which runs on Linux. Uh, Philips produces set-top boxes for cable TV, which run Linux. So there are lots and lots of applications where you don't think they are computers or they're running software, but they are running them, and they're running them behind the scenes. Um, their Linux is being used for uh, earthquake detection, for uh, neural logic signaling, and all over the place. And it's not just Linux. There are a whole set of applications that are being used and developed. So there is a lot more of, of open source out there than is necessarily visible. And there are many reasons for that, which I'll go into a bit later. One of the interesting examples is in smartphones and cell phones. So smartphones is the, f are the fastest growing segment of the cell phone market. These are phones which have things like PDAs and other stuff on them. And uh, the biggest market share there is Symbian, which is the operating system promoted by Nokia. About over half of smartphones run that. But after that, it's Linux. And the Linux share is growing at 85% a year, so it's almost doubling. And um, the thing is that these, these phones are not seen in Europe or America, probably not even here. We don't get to see these Linux phones because they're almost all in China. So all the Chinese phone manufacturers, and China is one of the fastest growing cell phone markets. It's the largest, more or less, now. Uh, the Chinese manufacturers are almost all using versions of Linux on their phones. And uh, among the big Western brands, um, I think Motorola is the only one that's been promoting or being using Linux on a number of its phones, but they're again phones that you buy in China. But Motorola said that they're going to launch one of their Linux phones um, in the US or in Europe later this year, so we might get to see more of that. So again, it's an example of uh, where the phones are in use, they are in everyday hands, they're, in, they're fairly reliable, you don't want your phone to keep rebooting, so it's all being used, but it's not something we necessarily think of as the software market. Now, another part of uh, open source, and there are lo there's lots of stuff we have in our report in terms of sales and market share and uh, how many people, um, uh, how many companies are using open source software, how much money is being spent on that. And a lot of that is from the standard consultancies, you know, Forrester, IDC, etc. But one thing that most most studies on the economic value of open source don't look at is what's the value of the software that's already out there. And that's something that's, uh, that's quite important because it might not be sold, uh, but the software is there and it's producing a lot of value. And there has to be some way of measuring that to get a sense of how important it is. And so we did that in two ways. One way of doing that was to look at the substitution cost. What would it cost to create the existing code base of free software if a company had to recreate it? And the way we did that was we took, firstly, we took the Debian distribution of Linux as the code base, because Debian is a very large code base. It's much more than just a Linux distribution. It includes a lot of stuff that's not on most of the portals, such as SourceForge. And one thing about Debian is that you could argue that at least there is some level of quality control in everything that is in there because someone has selected packages. Each package that gets into Debian has been selected by someone and someone is responsible for it. So we could argue that that's something that we can compare to commercial software. And what we did to do that was uh, use standard models of cost estimation that are used in the software industry to estimate how much effort it would take to create software projects of a certain size and applied that to Debian. And we applied that by going project by project, setting the different criteria in terms of how user-friendly it has to be, how memory-intensive a project has to be, and so on. And we estimated that the substitution cost for Debian in 2005 would be about 12 billion euros, so $15 billion or something, to create all the software that was there in a company the normal way it would have been created. So that's 163,000 person years. And what's interesting is that this is doubling in size every 18 to 24 months, the entire code, available code base, and it's, it's new stuff. Um, the code gets reviewed. About half of all the code that we have gets rewritten every five years. So the code is getting replaced every five years. Um, so it's being maintained continuously, but the total size available is doubling every 18 to 24 months. So 
what we expect would exist in 2010 would have cost a company then about 100 billion euro, 130 billion dollars to create. Now we also look, try to estimate the actual investment by companies in the code development by looking at, uh, looking at source code to see how much of the code we could identify as having been contributed by specific companies and uh, then adding up how much each of those companies must have spent at a, at a very minimum. And we think that at least one and a half billion dollars is being spent on a regular basis by companies by specific companies that we could identify. Now this was one way of looking at it, which is how much, how much it would have cost a company to develop the source code the way companies normally develop source code. Another way would be to try to find out how much time developers actually spent and uh, then value it. Again, you value these things based on you know, average salaries in the area you're looking at. So to try to get an estimate of how much time people have put into writing all the free software code. And that's not necessarily the same as applying a corporate cost estimation model because we don't know whether free software developers are more efficient or less efficient on average or do they do things that uh, companies don't do or do they not do things that companies have to do. So the cost estimation model for companies was based on actual data from companies. So it was based on interviewing lots and lots of companies about how much time they're spending, how much money they're spending, and looking at how much code they produce. So we tried to do something similar with, uh, with open source developers. And we did it in several different ways, and this took us a couple of years because we started off by uh, having surveys of open source developers and then to trying to find the code that they wrote. And finally, the most recent one that we did was last, uh, last spring and last summer where we actually picked a number of projects as, uh, as sample projects where we had access to all the version control data so we knew exactly who had written what code when and we interviewed a sample of the people who had written that code to ask them how much time they were spending. And based on that you could, you could use their time input and the code output to try to come up with a a model on how much effort is put in by individual open source developers to produce code of a certain size. So we estimated based on that that it would be about 130,000 person years over five years. And the cost is of course then a much rougher estimate because this is the time that people spent and we don't know how much they were actually paid or whether they were actually paid for what they were doing. So um, the cost, we look at it in terms of person years more than anything else. And uh, we also looked at the importance and the amount of time that is spent in coding versus non-coding activities. And all that put together, we ex estimate that there's a full-time employee equivalent of about 26,000 people, which is a pretty large company. And this is just people writing code. So if you look at the fact that in a proprietary software company, typically code writers represent about 30% of the company at most, and there's much more around that. So it represents quite a lot of effort. It's pretty significant in terms of uh, the amount of code created. And of course, as I said earlier, half of the code, half of all code is rewritten every five years. So there is a lot of maintenance going on and a lot of the code is changing. So it's not just, a dead capital, it's, it's something that's in improving and being increased. Now another thing to look at from an economic perspective is when you start talking to people about open source software, one of the things that they say is, hey, if you're giving away the software for free, how can you make money? And there are many ways that this has been answered and Brian is going to talk about that later as well. But the general assumption behind that is that people make money from software by selling it. And uh, in fact, that's not at all true. So we looked at a wonderful set of data from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, and we've started doing that for some other countries, but the US uh, has really the best data. For instance, in Europe, uh, you have that sort of data for individual countries, but by the time it's harmonized to all of Europe, it's lost. 
So the Bureau of Labor Statistics produces data for the number of employees, different types of employees and different types of jobs in different sectors of the industry at an extremely high level of detail, and this is all available free for download, which is nice. So one of the things that we found that uh, we looked, we focused at the core software developers, so programmers and computer engineer, computer software developers. We didn't look at software engineers and you know support jobs and things like that. Or we looked at that, but we treated that separately. So only 7% of programmers in the US actually work for companies that publish software. So for companies like Microsoft or Oracle or whatever, it's only 7% of programmers that work for them. About 30% of programmers in the US work in sectors that produce mainly custom software. So these are sectors where you know, there's huge amount of integration, all the big consultants, Pricewaterhouse, Accenture, all these consultants, and even companies like IBM, they produce huge amounts of custom software. And the thing about custom software and software integration like that is that the business model is not selling the software, but it's in fact selling the time that you spend writing the software. And the customer tends to own the software or have a lot of rights over the software that is received. It's totally different from packet software. And in the US, more than half of the programmers work in what we would call the user sector. They're not the sort of people who are making money from software. They're the sort of organizations, whether it's government, which in the US employs 12% of programmers, so that's more than the software publishing business. Finance, manufacturing, retail, tourism, all sorts of these other sectors which are not IT producers or not software producers at least. Computer manufacturing and so on. And for most of those companies, you're not actually trying to sell software, nor are you trying to make money from software in any way. You're in fact saving money for your company by writing good software that's somehow going to make things work better. The other way of looking at it is not in terms of employment, but in terms of uh, investment. So from the consumer side, how much money is spent. So in the US, only 16% of software spending is on packaged proprietary software. In Europe, it's about 19%. But anyway, it's less than a fifth of all the money spent on software goes on to proprietary packet software. So less than a fifth of software, of money in software is spent on buying software. Um, about 40% about in the US and 50% in Europe is on custom software, where you're buying not software, but you're buying people's time to develop software for you or integrate or customize software specifically for you. But in the US, more than half of software is developed in-house, and more than 30% of software spending in Europe is on developing software in-house. So what this tells you is that either way, selling software is a fairly small part of the market. So today's economics of software is that most people and firms who write software do not make money by selling software. They sell their time, or they are saving their company's money, or their employees' money. And this is, in fact, the opposite of most, what most people think. People think that you can make money by selling software, so the first question to ask is, how do you make money by not selling software with open source? But what we are able to show with this data is that is really the wrong question. You don't need to ask that question at all because nobody really makes money selling software, or it's just a handful of people who make money selling software. And this is the economics also of open source software. So today's economics of software is the same as today's economics of open source. Very few people make money by selling the software. They make money by doing other things. And in open source, you can do everything and charge for everything that you can in proprietary software except selling the software itself. And selling the software is a fairly small part of the software business. Of course, historically, this is, this is also an anomaly. It's not only an anomaly today that proprietary software is what's an anomaly, not open source. Proprietary software is what's unusual in the market. And it is unusual historically, because before the mid-1980s, software was not sold as a packaged product. Software was included with the hardware or provided with services. So what's happening now is pretty much um, with the resurgence of open source, you're seeing that being given more and more importance. But it's not just a question of going back to what was the model before the 80s. It's just staying with the model today. 
open source matches 90% of today's software market by jobs and 80% of today's software market by spending. Um, a lot of this is reflected by job postings. We did a study of job postings on various sites uh, around the world and um, found an average ratio of 70 to 30 for proprietary software skills to open source software skills. And this was a keyword based search, so we looked at lots of proprietary technologies and applications and equivalent open source technologies and applications. We didn't look for mutually exclusive job postings, so these are overlapping. You know, there might be someone there who asks for Oracle and MySQL. Uh, but it's again quite interesting, and we haven't done this over a period of time, so we don't know how fast it's growing, but it, it already seems quite significant that a third of the job postings for computers out there seem to uh, include open source skills. On the other hand, maybe it's not so surprising. Um, because in a series of surveys we've done since 2001, um, we've surveyed now more than 8,000 open source developers around the world in different sets of surveys in Europe, in the US, in Japan, and individual countries around the world in different languages. And what is one thing that's consistent is when you look at motivations, there are lots and lots of different motivations. And Barbara mentioned some of them in her talk. But there are lots and lots of different motivations that are often overlapping and that are not necessarily consistent with the rewards that people get. But the one key thing that is always uh, struck us is that the most commonly cited motivation by developers is that it's a place to learn and develop new skills. You participate in open source software development to learn and develop new skills. Of course, this is not something for the top end of developers who um, already know a lot, but for the majority of participants, this is the uh, key reason. And because of that, we try to investigate what these skills are and how much of this learning actually takes place. Because if you look at it as a place to learn and develop new skills and these skills leading to jobs, that might be something that's worth looking at. And so we did a couple of surveys that were focused just on this aspect. One was done mainly in Europe and the US in 2005. And uh, another was done across the world, including in South Africa with, with UWC as a partner um, over the past year. And we had two sets of surveys. We surveyed developers to ask them what skills they think they learn in, uh, in open source communities, how these skills compare to what they could learn in formal courses, do these skills help them get jobs, and uh, do they think they're discriminated against compared to people who've got proprietary software skills. And we compared that to a parallel survey that we ran of companies, of employers. And we did that in Europe, and then we did that again in, in several developing countries, and I'll look at the results a bit later. But essentially what we found was that the skills that are learned, that skills are indeed learned. It's not just um, an imaginary thing that people think that this is what they would like to do. They actually feel they learn specific skills. The skills that are learned are not only technical skills, but also in a lot of other areas, such as management and teamwork or um, uh, awareness of legal issues. And in many ways, that, wasn't, uh, that was interesting, and that, that's where I think a lot of the value arises, because if you compare uh, skills learned in a participation in an open source environment to a formal course, you're going to compare it with a formal computer science course where typically you don't learn how to manage people or how to work in teams or how to license software. Whereas that's the sort of thing that you do learn and you have to learn um, in open source. Um, and what's interesting is that a lot of these skills were valued by employers. Employers recognized, even employers who did not have open source as an important aspect to their business, they recognized the value of these skills and they recognized that these skills, many of these skills can be better learned in open source communities than in formal courses because a lot of these skills are seen to be learning by doing skills. So when you talk about management, I give the example of, you know, the Linux kernel or any other such large software project, uh, it's often much more difficult uh, to manage a project where 
you might have a few thousand people who are spread all around the world who don't meet each other very often, who aren't necessarily motivated by the fact that if they don't perform on schedule, they're going to be fired. And still to get them to all work together and come up with something that, um, that is a successful product requires a lot of teamwork and a lot of team management skills. Even though we don't necessarily think of the geeks working in open source as uh, very socially adept, in fact, they're obviously pretty sophisticated at getting people to work with them. And, and you see examples, when you see case studies, you see examples of fights that take place because someone is particularly unpleasant and not nice to work with and the project doesn't work very well because of that. So you see the importance of those skills. And what's interesting is that employers recognize this too. Employers find it quite clear that uh, management skills and teamwork skills are one of the things that they think are learned better in the open source community than in formal courses. Um, and finally, looking at another aspect of, uh, of the economic impact, um, and I'll get back to the skills and the results from the surveys when we're looking at participation in different parts of the world. Innovation is one of the, one of the key things that everyone in policy circles talks about, and uh, it's one of the key justifications for things such as strong copyright, strong patents, and... Uh, and proprietary software. If you can't make money selling software, how do you innovate? That's one of the key things that comes up. So, of course, there's been a lot of, there's been a lot of work, a sort of theoretical justification of why innovation works well through, um, through collaboration, why it's better to, uh, why, why it's possibly more innovative, uh, more innovation can result from open collaboration and sharing. And uh, lots of examples are provided for that. So we tried to look at, uh, to try to quantify that. And uh, one of the things that we found was that you, open source software can save at least a third in terms of software R&D investment just by looking at the amount of code that gets reused. And, of course, software R&D investment, when you save a lot of money in software R&D, that can lead to extra profits. But... More importantly, it can lead to investing in more use, investment that's more usefully spent in new innovation rather than rebuilding what someone else has already done, but you just didn't know about it because it was hidden somewhere in, in someone's product. And one example of, of this sort of innovation is something um, that Nokia produced. Nokia came up with this thing called the N770 last, last year, and earlier this year it was an N800. It's an innovative new product because it's not a PDA, it's not a phone, it's a handheld internet browser, and I have one of them in my bag. Um, it's, it, the idea was to come up with something that doesn't offer the standard functionality. So it won't offer PDA functionality, it won't offer a phone, and it's, uh, but it will have full internet connectivity and Bluetooth, and uh, let's see what happens to it. And Nokia could have easily turned it into a PDA or a phone, but then that would have been a PDA or a phone, and they didn't really want to go to that area of the market. So it was a risky product, and what did they do? They took, um, they took Debian, Linux, and uh, made a platform that they called MIMO, which was an open collaborative platform for this device with a special user interface and things like that developed for it. And they made it completely open. Um, completely in the sense that a lot of it is uh, they were forced to use the GPL, uh, so it is open and has to remain open. When you make changes to it, you have to share those changes. But they also had a, had a big platform where developers could contribute and um, they told developers how they would use their contributions and so on. So when they first released this, less than 2% of the software that was on the system was actually written by them. And so we estimated that they saved about over a billion dollars on software development for this, just by looking at all the code that they used. So the first version, the N770, which was released, didn't have any email readers because they didn't want to constrain it in that way. Someone ported Evolution over to the N770, and... Uh, in the N800, which they released in January this year, it's got um, Evolution, which is a sort of Outlook clone um, that works on this. 
someone had the bright idea of using this device as a GPS navigation device. So they came up with, um, with free software to download from Google Maps and other places the maps for the route that you were going to take and to interface with a GPS device and actually plot routes. And if you're connected to the internet, it would download stuff on the fly. If you weren't connected, you could give it your route. It would figure out what your route was and download the maps for that before you actually left. Um, so Nokia didn't see that as something that they wanted to include in their new product. But what they did instead was they went and bought a GPS, mobile GPS services company. So now you can pay extra and you can get a uh, navigation system in, in your Nokia 800, or you can for free download the, the free one. Um, they saw a lot of people writing chat software, so they went and put in a video camera in the Nokia N800, so it's this tiny, but it also has a video camera that pops out, and you can do video telephony, um, again, using only free software. So for that, of course, Nokia has contributed a lot back to the free software community when they made their video telephony application. They used it built upon other GPL code and they released it as GPL. It's kind of irritating because it's only available for Windows or the N800, but it is based on an application that was available on many other platforms and since it's GPL, someone will port it. So Nokia is, you know, they spend their money on where they have to spend their money to do something that's new and um, they, rely on a, a larger community to take it to other directions. And that's how they were able to make this risky product. So that's a good, good concrete example of how open source can lead to a lot of innovation in the classical R&D sector. Um, now I'm going to go into a bit more into results from our surveys and other data sources on where open source gets written and how it gets written. So the first thing to look at perhaps is who writes, uh, who writes open source code in terms of what type of, what type of people they are. So it's, um, there's always been some uh, a, a sort of lack of awareness about whether code is written in, you know, people assume that it's written by millions and millions of individuals, but in fact it's not. It tends to be written, most of the code tends to be written by well, I'll show you that one first. Most of the code tends to be written by a few people. And uh, what this slide basically shows is it shows the share of code on this axis and the share of developers on this axis. And the best way to understand this is that if everyone wrote everything, everyone wrote exactly the same amount of code, you'd have a line like that. So by the time you got to half of the code, it would have been written by half of the developers. But in fact, what you have is when you, when you get to 75% of the code, it's written by the top 10% or so of developers. And uh, this, these are different lines for different projects. So we basically took hundreds and hundreds of projects and plotted their curves. And you see that they all, um, they're all around the same area. So about two thirds, three quarters of the code is written by the top 10%. When you get to bigger and bigger projects, the ones with yellow and red lines, with more than 50, 100 developers, it becomes even more concentrated. This is, in fact, not something that's unique to writing software. This is a typical, uh, typical thing for any self-organizing, self-feedback-based uh, system. So you find exactly the same thing when you're looking, for instance, at academic citations or the books that are checked out of a library or um, other such things which are self-influencing and self-organizing. Um, but what it does tell you is it, it shows you how leadership works in, in open source developer communities. It's, it's leading by doing. So those who are actually most active are the ones who lead. And when they're not most active anymore, they're not the ones who lead. So I don't have the slides here with me for that. But we've got some very interesting data on different projects where we try to plot generations of leaders. So we take the top, uh, top 20 contributors at any given point in time and plot their share of the code over the entire lifetime. So we did that, for instance, with FreeBSD, and we took it, divided it into, you know, looked at FreeBSD over 10 years and looked at the top developers in each, each year and plotted their contribution over time. 
And what we got was this, was this very interesting graph which looked like that, but it was phase shifted. So you had one which looked like that, another which looked like that, another which looked like that, and there were 10 peaks. And what, what you saw there was that the people who were the top contributors in the first year, by the 10th year, they were not, all, not there at all. And the people who were the second rung contributors in the first year became the top contributors in the second year, and they were back to the second running in the third year, and by the end, they were again not very much there. And those who were the top contributors at the 10th year were hardly there in the first year. So you had these generations of leaders who were replacing each other. And this, of course, differs from project to project. In the case of FreeBSD, there were generations of leaders replacing each other. In the case of uh, Apache, for instance, the core group was pretty much constant throughout. So you have different sets, different leadership styles that take place, but they all really depend on this basic assumption that those who are most active are, uh, are those who end up uh, leading by default. And um, when we, we also looked at a lot of the code base and tried to identify whether it, what sort of organizations or individuals were, were creating it. And this is, of course, a very rough estimate because you can, um, there are lots of individuals whom you, who might be working at companies without the knowledge of their companies or without their companies trying to claim credit in any way, um, which might overstate the individual contribution. On the other hand, there's a lot of code out there which comes out uh, with only corporate identification, such as OpenOffice, where the entire copyright is claimed by Sun, even though it's written by many individuals who are outside Sun. So that would inflate the corporate side of things. So we think that this is a reasonably good rough uh, indication of the percentage of code. And what's interesting to see here is that the corporate contribution has been, has been growing, and um, especially in the past uh, five years or so. Without the individual contribution shrinking too much, what has been shrinking is in fact uh, uh, universities and academics. So what's been happening is that open source software is getting more professionalized in the sense that it's no longer produced by students or anything, not that it was, very much, but a lot of it is now um, is, is now either at companies or at um, individuals who are learning and end up going into companies after that. If you look at where people are who write uh, open source, there are lots of different ways of looking at that, and I'm going to show you a series of maps. This plots uh, le leaders or maintainers of Debian GNU Linux, and um, as someone commented, uh, this is very similar to a map of the world at night where you can see uh, where all the electricity connections are. Um, we look at that explicitly in, in some other graphs because what you can see here, of course, is, a, is increased con concentration in, in Western Europe and on the east and west coast of the U.S., a little bit in Japan, and a little bit here and there. Um, if you look at globally contributing developers, um, and I should qualify this by pointing out that um, it's very difficult to get at developer communities in some isolated areas, such as in China, for instance. A lot of developers there are not integrated into the global community simply because of linguistic or other cultural issues. And typically, they interact with the global community through spokespeople. So you might have the one guy in a group that speaks English or is comfortable with communicating with others who will be committing for 20 other people. But um, we believe that there is a difference between just developing stuff on your own and developing stuff in a global community. And so one of the ways of looking at the global community was to look at data from SourceForge. Um, and SourceForge does have a U.S. bias in terms of its developers. We know lots of people who are not on SourceForge or other similar things. But SourceForge is probably the most uh, single largest globally active community of developers. We also did this analysis for other things such as, you know, the mailing lists of large projects such as GNOME and other things like that. But right now I'm going to show you only the data from SourceForge. 
So according to SourceForge data, there are um, over a million developers registered today. In fact, most of these developers don't develop. They're just there. And uh, we look at the uh, activity of developers in the next slide. And uh, most, uh, so the Europe and the U.S. and Canada dominate. Together they account for uh, more than 80%. Or, but between them, they're about split 50-50 with the U.S. slightly higher. This is in terms of just the people registered in SourceForge. You have some of the bigger Indian Asian countries, China, India, Japan, and Korea there, and the rest of the world um, making up um, about uh, uh, 200,000 developers, so about 15, 15%. Now, if you actually look at uh, the core developers, so the people who are actually committing code by region, then it's a slightly different picture you get. Um, Again, it is uh, the U.S. and Canada and Europe that really dominate, though sometime in 2003 the Europeans have uh, gone ahead of the North Americans in terms of active developers. Um, and you see much smaller rate of growth in, uh, in Asia, though you see a higher rate of growth in, in the rest of the world. So there is an increasing amount of activity taking place in other parts of the world, outside the U.S. and Europe, but it remains still very much dominated by U.S. and Europe in terms of code contribution. Um, and this brings us to some of the things that were, were mentioned at, at one of the talks yesterday in terms of whether, you know, Africa or Asia or other parts of the world should be just consuming access to knowledge or access to software or should they be actually creating their own stuff. And it's something that I'll go into a bit later. Because if you look at a world map and you look at it by population, sorry for the graphs, I just had to copy and paste them from somewhere else in a bit of a rush, so they're a bit skewed. Um, so the redder the color is, the more people there are there who are emitting. Now this, we've actually normalized for population density. So by population density, or by, by actual number of people, again, it's parts of, uh, parts of Europe, Scandinavia, Australia, the US, Canada, that are the biggest contributors, followed by other things. But this is very, very deceptive, because just as the, the map of Debian leaders looked like the map of when the lights, when electricity is there, this is, in fact, a function not of popula population, but of many other things. So we look at uh, internet connections as a proxy. So when you look at the world map of commuters by internet penetration, suddenly you have uh, less variation, and the U.S. is not so important. In fact, the U.S. contributes just about as much as Brazil, Argentina, and Uruguay, and less than Russia or Australia. Um, the Madagascar thing is a little outlier, and that seems to be because of strange data on Internet penetration. Um, uh, but, uh, and you have to remember that the, the numbers here can, these are ratios, so they can be skewed by very small numbers. But again, here you find that when you look at Internet penetration, there's much less variance. Okay, so over here you had a lot of bright reds, and everything else was gray. Here you have much less in terms of bright red, and South Africa, for instance, has become a slightly darker shade. And a lot of it has to do with wealth. If you look at it by GDP per capita, simply, the U.S. there again is still high, and that just shows you that the U.S. has far more Internet connections than their wealth alone would show. So give, with all else in wealth being equal, the U.S. is much more connected to the Internet. But when you look at GDP per capita, when you look at it by wealth, then South Africa is there quite high. And uh, in fact, it's India and China which are absolutely the highest. So India is about, India was the single highest uh, country in terms of commuters by average wealth. So um, the causes are not so much lack of interaction or uh, lack of communication or community being left out, 
as much as very basic things such as access to an internet connection, access to a PC. And when you've got enough people with access to PCs, a small fraction of them becomes free software developers. So if you don't have enough of them, then you're going to have much fewer free software developers. Um, I'm just going to look at, finally, some, um, some comparisons between um, uh, people in a surveys, in, in these surveys that we did of developers around the world. Well, one of the interesting things that we looked at was, was gender. We did a whole anthropological study done by Cambridge University on why there are so few women in open source compared to the traditional software industry. Um, and I'm not going to go into that. I've talked about that before. Uh, one of the things that we found in the survey outside Europe and the U.S. was that the share of women was considerably higher. And this was especially so in Malaysia and China, where in U.S. and Europe, the, well, and, and in South Africa, the average share of women developers is about 2 or 3 percent. But uh, the average across all our countries was 6 percent, and in China and uh, Malaysia, it was 10, or in Malaysia, even 20 percent. In Malaysia, in fact, I've been at IT conferences, and half the audience is women or more. And uh, in fact, they, they were telling me in the IT ministry in the Malaysian government that they've actually tried to put out quotas to get men into uh, the ministry because uh, uh, IT seems to be very pro-women, but the rest of Malaysian society is not, so they need to have some men, and all the senior IT officials in the Malaysian government are women. Um, there, there are many explanations for these sort of things, which I'm not going to go into. Uh, the average age in uh, outside Europe and the U.S. is a bit higher. It's a couple of years older than in, in Europe and the U.S. And uh, one big reason for that is, uh, is access to technology and when people get, get access to technology. So, um, again, it's the Internet connections. And I'm, I'm, I think I'm sort of running out of time, and I want to have some room for questions. So I'm not going to go into the rest of this, basically. But we looked at... Uh, we looked at skills and how they are better learned in open source and, and uh, what sort of skills lead to, um, um, lead to jobs and how these skills are actually being learned. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm actually not going to go into all that. I'll just look at the last one. So does, does experience in open source communities compensate for the lack of formal degrees? And uh, this was a very nice, uh, nice one that we got because um, it, the answer is a resounding yes from developers and a slightly resounding but still clear yes from, from companies. Now, the experience that you get, if you can prove it, so you can't just say, I did some open source stuff, but if you wrote the driver for the, you wrote a printer driver for Linux, well, you prove it. That certainly counts as a compensation for lack of formal degrees. And the variation between countries is, uh, is quite a lot. So uh, in uh, countries like Japan, it's very evenly balanced, and a majority, in fact, thinks that you need a formal degree. You can't, experience is not good enough. Whereas in countries like uh, India or Croatia, it's a very large majority that thinks that the degrees don't really matter. And... Uh, in Europe and the U.S., though, it was quite, uh, quite a big contrast. So this was the degrees matter. It was only about 20%, and uh, experience in open source was about 80%. So it really differs from country to country culturally, and it has to do with the awareness of open source, and I suppose the extent of activity that in open source that takes place there. Um, a similar thing was shown by... Who's going to get a job if there are people with similar credentials? One person has floss experience, another has proprietary software experience. Um, so in, uh, in Europe and the U.S., what we found according to developers, developers claim that people with uh, open source experience were more advantaged or that they would be treated equally. Employers didn't quite say that, but employers generally like to say that open source or proprietary experience would be treated equally. 
which meant that they didn't really value one above the other, which is actually a good thing because the general assumption might be that, uh, well, if you've got open source experience, it's not formally certified that much. Again, you saw a lot of variation between countries. In India, there was a strong preference for uh, people with open source credentials, and this was reflected among, country, among companies as well. And this is not because companies are doing open source, but because if you've done open source, then that proves many things about you, that you can work with lots of people, that you uh, are, are writing code that other people use, and so on. Um, so finally, I think when we want to talk about access and global participation, this is a favorite quote of mine from a former prime minister of Spain who spent an hour talking at an open source conference a couple of years ago where he said that access is not enough, it's the ability to participate and to create is what matters. And that's what I think annoys me a lot about discussions about access which tend to imply that people in developing countries are supposed to become dumb consumers. And um, the whole digital divide dialogue is, in effect, talking about laying the pipes or subsidizing um, hardware, but not really talking so much about giving back. And the fact is that you've got brains everywhere which could be contributing just as much as they could be receiving. So while I wouldn't go so far as to say, as yesterday's speaker did, that, uh, you know, that it's important to create your own knowledge because I think you don't need an African word processor. A word processor is a word processor. What you do is to be, you need to be able to get the brains here to contribute just as much as the brains elsewhere to do things that are globally useful. There are some things that are more useful in one location as different from another. But what is important is the ability to participate and give back. And that's where I think the main problems lie today in, uh, well, basically two areas. The first area is in terms of simple access to technology and infrastructure to be able to connect to the Internet. If you can't, then it's going to be difficult. Um, I mean, I worked on the DOS port of GCC in 1993 in Delhi, and uh, I remember that due to the incredibly slow Internet connection, my patches would never get onto the main tree because I could never really send them. So I had to keep... Uh, keep getting new versions of GCC and keep porting them over and over again to DOS um, because I could never send anything back. So uh, it's, it's, things are better today, I think, but uh, not always much better. Last week I was in, uh, in the northern part of Cyprus, and Cyprus, as you know, is divided between Turkish Cyprus and Greek Cyprus, and there are lots of political problems there. And in North Cyprus, there is no internet because no country recognizes them, so you can't actually connect to them. They can only connect over satellite to Turkey, which is frightfully expensive. So um, they, uh, they don't have internet. On the other hand, they don't have uh, uh, proprietary software either, at least not legally. So... Um, and, and so the barriers to global participation and Internet connectivity is, of course, extremely important. But then there's a the language and lack of community contact. And uh, that is a problem, probably not so much in Africa, but that is a problem in other parts of the world, as well as more skepticism and a lack of successful role models. So I find it really bizarre when, you know, I go to, I have someone from, say, Bangladesh who tells me that we need to work on proprietary software because otherwise we can't have a software industry. And I'm like, you're not going to have Microsoft coming out of Bangladesh. You don't have Microsoft coming out of anywhere other than Redmond. So that's where you have the, th that's where I think actually learning about the economics of software, where nobody uh, makes money by selling software, almost, other than Microsoft and a few others, is very important. So there needs to be more awareness. But you can see clearly in, in some parts of the world where, uh, if you were working in proprietary software or in a commercial software job and you earn lots and lots of money, you might not want to spend very much time doing things voluntarily. So then that requires a shift in change of businesses that work on business models. And the other thing is, of course, downplaying uh, local needs, that, um, um, that global participation often tends to downplay needs of local communities. You know, is this going to work at the global thing and uh, otherwise uh, it's a problem. So I'll, I'll just end there. And um, the entire report on the economics can be found online, and a lot more on the global participation is also there. Thank you.
I'm from the, the financial industry. Where, from Alaska. I'm from the financial industry where um, the, the financial side is very important. And listening to your speech, I'm surprised that you don't focus on the value added side. One of the biggest advantages of uh, the open source model is that the marketing chain is so much shorter. So not only are you paying for the Redmond program, but you're paying for his marketing department at all as well. You know, what, what their money is basing, you're not spent on programming, it's basically spent on telling you what a good idea it was to buy a Microsoft product. Now, um, and two, two of the areas that I've, I've come to, which is Cyprus is one of the strong areas for our product, and Holland, which is where you come from, is another very strong market for us. And one of the things we do there is to convince their governments that the, that the investment in open source is so, much, is so much more. And the benefit is not looking at the area that you're looking at, but looking at the bigger section. And if I compare it to products that are now compared to things like uh, Intuit or Sage or, or Microsoft, where the yeah, Holland has got a very weak industry, what we try to say to them there is it's the replacement. It's not the development aspect, it's the replacement. So, for example, if you buy one of our, our products, it's, a, it's replacing $1,000. It's the $200 that goes to spend to, to motivate his shareholders why he must take this inefficient risk on a proprietary mechanism. Three or $400 just to pay for his marketing and advertising budget. If that is reversed into all these countries all trying to stimulate small businesses, if that's moved back into the small business market, it creates a, a spin-off that's much, much larger. So you see, I think you've missed 70% of it. By looking only at the development section, you're looking at a tiny part of it, which is 20% of the business. Well, I, I could talk for hours. I mean, the report is 300 pages and has a lot on, uh, on local value added and, uh, and how companies save on marketing costs or how companies save on maintenance or various other things. I think Brian is going to address some of that, so uh, um, I, I'll leave that to him. But, yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly there's a hell of a lot to this in terms of companies and how they work how they save money by saving on marketing, by distributing their maintenance across an entire community, and so on. That's, uh, that's very important, and that uh, is, uh, we've got dozens of pages on that, though it's not in this talk. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation, and um, I'm glad that we can go and download the report. Um, I just have a question. The one slide that you showed showed an increase in corporate development in OSS. Um, do you have any indication if it was for internal use projects or external as a service? And uh, the role of the CIO, uh, the Chief Information Officer, within that, was it uh, extensive or something? Well, uh, that, that was actually looking at published open source code. So uh, the published open source code that's uh, contributed to by corporations tends to be uh, the majority of corporations doing that are companies in the software area with a, with, a, with a software strategy or an open source software strategy, like IBM and so on. We have actually got, again, it's there in our, in our report, we have got some data on non-computer non companies contributing open source code. And the idea there is likely to be that they are doing it for their own internal needs to begin with, but then they go on. They just go and release them. Um, in the the ability of programmers to the sort of ten percent of the programmers contributing seventy five percent of the code. When you were looking at those source for projects, was there a distinction between different languages or different environments that people are more easily able to enter, or was it pretty much? The same across well, the Well, it's, I mean, the, the chart that uh, you saw there is actually, I think, over a hundred or a thousand projects. There's, there's a lot of projects in there. Each of them has their own line. So it, there's really not very much difference if you just want to look at the general shape of the curve. Of course, when you look at specific things, you can find, uh, you know, generally you'd say that the bigger the project, the more, uh, more concentration there is. It has nothing to do with the technology as such. <laughs> 